Hello, I am Daniel Neumeyer, Vice President of Education, Space Center Houston. We are a nonprofit and dynamic science and space exploration learning center. We are also the official visitor center of NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human spaceflight with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's first virtual astronaut visit. Today's program features a presentation from retri retired astronaut, Dr. Leroy Chow, followed by a moderated Q&A session. As a leading science and space exploration learning center, we provide robust digital learning experiences and exceptional access to leaders in space science. Today's program is one way you can be part of the NASA mission. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few updates about Space Center Houston. As you know, following state, local, and CDC guidelines, Space Center Houston temporarily closed in mid-March due to the pandemic. Throughout our closure, we are providing more digital learning experiences to make science and space exploration learning accessible to everyone. Check out our Space Center Houston blog for engaging content like our new History Up Close video series featuring an insider look at our extensive artifact collection. Plus, we have a new Try This at Home blog series providing you interactive science-based activities students and families can do together. Did you know you can take a virtual tour of the museum from home? Download the Space Center Houston free app for augmented reality and videos about the future and historic feats in human space exploration. The app is available in Apple and Android devices. And to take part in other digital learning experiences, go to our one-stop shop webpage, spacecenter.org backslash resources. And now for more exciting news. We recently announced after careful consideration and following the state, local, and CDC guidelines, Space Center Houston will reopen July 1st. We look forward to safely welcoming back guests with new exhibits, spacious outdoor experiences, and additional healthy and safety measures at the forefront of our daily operations. It will be a new enhanced experience with additional health and safety measures so that when every guest returns to Space Center Houston, we want you to feel safe and inspired through our authentic learning experiences. All guests will need a timed admission ticket, allowing us to limit the number of people in the center. To help guests plan their visit, we will add a new visitor guide to our website. Stay tuned, we'll announce soon when our new timed admission ticket will go on sale. For the latest information on our reopening, please stay connected with us on our website spacecenter.org and on social media. Now on to the program, Space Center Houston's virtual astronaut visit. I'd like to introduce our very special guest speaker, retired astronaut, Dr. Leroy Chow. Dr. Chow was selected as an astronaut in 1990 and is a veteran of four space flights. He logged a total of 229 days in space including 36 hours of spacewalk time. He also became the first American to vote in a presidential election while in space in 2004. Dr. Chow retired from NASA in 2005 and now is the CEO of One Orbit, which inspires passion, boldness, and curiosity through keynotes, workshops, and school programs. He earned a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And to add to all these accomplishments, he also speaks English, Russian, and Mandarin. We are so excited to work with Dr. Chow for many of our programs, and we're very excited to welcome him to this first Space Center Houston virtual astronaut visit. Let's watch an exciting video.
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daniel, for that very nice uh, introduction. I'm very excited to be here today to be the kickoff of the new Space Center in Houston Virtual Astronaut Program. And as you know, uh, my name is Leroy Chow, and I'm an astronaut. Over my 15-year NASA career, I did get the chance to fly four times into space. Uh, my first three missions were aboard space shuttles, and on my fourth flight, I trained with the Russians. We launched aboard a Soyuz rocket, and we flew to the International Space Station, where I served as the commander and NASA science officer during Expedition 10. Well, I grew up during the 1960s, during the very beginning of the space race, during the Cold War. I followed those early missions with a lot of interest, and it was a really exciting time. Back then, uh, the guys that were my heroes were the uh, people like uh, Alan Shepard, the very first American to fly into space. But it really was the Apollo Moon program that captured my imagination and made me start to dream about uh, getting into space myself. Even as an eight-year-old, uh, that was an exciting thing. And as you all probably know, last summer, uh, about a year ago, was the 50th anniversary of that event. And so I'd like to show you this uh, video that NASA put together that kind of captures the excitement of the Apollo 11 moon mission. At 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, Nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn for We're pretty busy for a minute. Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. Uh, it's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston. Guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're clear for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Seven, six, five, engine arm asset. Wow, hard to believe that was 50 years ago, almost 51 years ago now. Uh, and like I said, I was eight years old watching that, but I remember like it was yesterday watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take those first steps on the moon. And that's what started my dream as an eight-year-old of wanting to become an astronaut myself. So I worked very hard and I studied hard and I went to university, studied engineering, got three degrees in chemical engineering. And a few years after that, I applied to NASA and was fortunate enough to be selected and here's kind of a funny picture of me. This is obviously a long time ago. I think we're coming up on 30 years and maybe 20 pounds ago. I was part of the uh, 13th astronaut group selected by NASA. And we came from all across the United States. Uh, we were a mixture of men and women, people from different uh, cultural backgrounds, different heritages. We were research engineers like me. We were military test pilots from the different services, had a couple of uh, medical doctors and a couple of physicists to round out the group. And we all came together at the Johnson Space Center here in Houston to begin our training. After a few years of training, I did get assigned to my first mission and started getting ready for that. And four years after arriving, I got to fly my first mission into space aboard Space Shuttle Columbia. 
Our mission, we were the second international microgravity laboratory. And what that means is that in the back of the payload bay of the space shuttle, instead of having a, a, uh, a satellite or something like that, we actually had a lab module called Space Lab, and we spent two weeks in space conducting scientific research. After returning from that mission, I was pretty quickly turned around onto my second flight. This time I was flying aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. And our main mission was to use the robotic arm of the space shuttle to retrieve a Japanese satellite that had been launched three months prior, loaded with different kinds of material samples so we could study the effects of the space environment on those materials. But the biggest deal for me personally is the first chance I had to put on the big white space suit and go out and lead my first two spacewalks. And what we were doing, we were testing tools and construction techniques that we would later use to actually build the International Space Station. On my third flight, I did get to participate in some of that build. We were flying up to the space station on Space Shuttle Discovery. We were the second major assembly mission of the space station program. And as you can see, as the, even as we left the space station, this is us departing after having installed two large pieces on it, it was still pretty small. We launched our mission and after we returned only two weeks later, the very first uh, crew flew up to stay aboard the station. During our assembly mission, I, we, I again led the spacewalk team on four EVAs, four spacewalks, two, two by each team, two teams. And what we did is installed those two big pieces onto the station. And we also installed the main data link between the station and the ground. So that big antenna dish we installed during EVA while my partner held the two pieces together. I used a power tool and I drove four bolts to uh, connect that thing up. Then we made it up the electrical cables. And even today, all the video and all the data from the experiments and some of the vehicle telemetry flow through that antenna through the satellite system uh, back down to the ground. After the landing of Space Shuttle Discovery, somehow I had been at NASA 10 years and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next when the chief asked me if I would train to, to join the Expedition Corps. That is, he asked me if I would be willing to go fly up to the station, live and work uh, on, on a mission that turned out to be six and a half months long. Uh, and so it was a pretty big commitment. I did take a couple of days to think about it. The training was actually the bigger commitment. It would be three and a half years of training. I'd be spending half of that time in Russia, one month in Russia, one month in Houston, because Russia is the other major partner of the International Space Station program. I would have to learn the Russian language because, of course, working with the Russian instructors and working with Russian Mission Control and their management, they didn't speak English. Cosmonauts had to do the same thing. They had to spend half of their time here in Houston, had to learn English for the same reasons. Uh, so it was a big uh, commitment by all of us, but uh, we all agreed that these were by far the most rewarding missions of our, of our careers. Flying aboard a Russian Soyuz was also really very interesting after having been aboard uh, three space shuttles and launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on a Soyuz rocket was a very, very different experience than launching uh, out of Cape Canaveral aboard a space shuttle. But in either case, you get from the launch pad up into, uh, up into low Earth orbit in about uh, nine minutes, right around nine minutes, up to your orbital speed of about 17,500 miles an hour. Well, for Expedition 10, my Russian crewmate was a, a Russian Air Force colonel. In fact, he was, uh, at the time, the youngest full colonel in the Russian Air Force. And so we got to spend uh, six and a half months up there together. Main purpose of the station is scientific research. So we did as many experiments as we could. But the main purpose of our series of flights at that time uh, was maintenance and repair. And that's because we were flying only about a year a uh, year and a half after the Space Shuttle Columbia accident and the Space Shuttle was still grounded and we needed to keep the station in a state of good repair until we could get the shuttle flying again so that we could actually go ahead and finish building the station. We did get to do two Russian spacewalks uh, and this was a real treat for me because I'd become a specialist in using American spacesuits and American tools and this was a chance to try their system out. We did a lot of different things. We installed a robotic uh, experiment, a remote controlled robotic experiment. We retrieved experiment packages that had been left outside by previous crews, and uh, uh, we, we furthered space station construction by installing navigation antennas that would be used by future cargo ships. Well, spaceflight really is a magical experience. It's a life-changing experience. I don't think anyone flies up into space without some pretty serious introspection about what it all means. And our favorite activity up there is to look back at our beautiful Earth and take photographs. On this mission alone, I shot over 16,000 photos of the Earth. I'd just like to share a few with you. 
Here we're looking uh, over the Himalaya mountains into China and from our perch of about 280 ups, uh, miles up, the Himalayas look pretty small, but remember down there somewhere is uh, uh, Mount Everest, the tallest peak on the earth. Here's a picture of some different places around the world. This is Beijing, the capital of China. You can see the light snowfall is really helping to bring out some of the detail. The, the rectangle in the middle of the photograph, that's the uh, forbidden city where the old emperors used to live. Here's a picture of New York City. This is uh, Manhattan Island. You can see Central Park clearly. You can see the skyscrapers. You can see boats in the east and the Hudson Rivers. This is the southern tip of Florida. This is a really beautiful part of the world, South Florida and the Bahamas. The blues and greens just jump out at you and it's really unlike anywhere else in the world. Here are glaciers in Patagonia and Argentina. Uh, really a striking feature to be able to see from space. These are the Great Pyramids at Giza. You can see some man-made objects, big cities of course. The pyramids I did finally find and you can see the two clear ones and the two big ones pretty clearly in the middle of the screen. And if you go down from the two big ones, you can make out the third smaller one. And then if you look to the left of the third smaller one, you can make out the outline of the Sphinx. Sometimes the most desolate areas on the earth are also the most striking. This is the Salamat Basin in Chad. This one is one of my favorites. This is Lake Nasser in Egypt. I was able to capture this photograph just at the right time when the angle of the sun was reflecting almost perfectly off the surface of the water into the camera lens and it lit up brightly and this is exactly, this is really what it looked like looking out the window. Sometimes Mother Nature is just funny. I saw this picture and I grabbed the camera and had the perfect thing to send on my wife for Valentine's Day. It was pretty hard to, been hit pretty hard to top though. Well, six and a half months was about up. It was time for us to start thinking about coming home. Uh, the Russian Mission Control Center asked us to put our suits back on to make sure they still fit because in space, in the absence of gravity, uh, your, your spine relaxes and you end up stretching out about one and a half inches. And so they wanted to make sure they still fit and they have to accommodate for that when they build your suit. Of course, being operational guys, we had a good laugh. Uh, what were they gonna do if the suits didn't fit? We were still gonna come home. Here's Salajan in the center seat for, uh, for entry. And here I am in the right seat for entry. This is about 45 minutes before touchdown, before the deorbit burn. You can see it's pretty cramped inside that soil. It's a lot more roomy in the space shuttle. The space shuttle is definitely more of a, a business class seating arrangement, whereas the Soyuz is definitely much more super economy. Space shuttle, of course, had wings. So once it came down in the atmosphere, it turned into an airplane and it would land on a conventional runway. In the case of capsule spacecraft, you have to uh, use a, a parachute. And uh, even though you're using a parachute, you're still falling fast, so about 25 feet per second. And so right before touchdown, those solid rocket motors do fire to slow you down. We have other shock absorbing uh, things. And so it hit, hit the ground pretty hard. It doesn't hurt too bad though. Uh, here you can see that we've tipped over, which happens sometimes, making it even less comfortable. But the rescue forces were right on top of us. Uh, they got us out of the vehicle in about 20 minutes, sat us down in lawn chairs. Uh, handed a satellite phone so that we call our families and loved ones and let them know that we were safe. After a quick ceremony in Kazakhstan, they put us back on the airplanes. They flew us back to Star City outside of Moscow. There we are reunited with our, our families. And then I spent the rest of the year kind of closing things out, doing the debriefs, writing the reports. Saljan and I, uh, you know, we kind of we kind of uh, visited everyone and thanked everyone who had helped make our mission such a great success. And then it was time to move on and do other things. I had such a rich flying career, been at NASA for 15 years. It was time to give some of the younger folks behind me a chance to go fly their missions. So I stayed in the Houston area and started doing a lot of different things, including uh, some consulting work and some speaking. And uh, let's see, some years ago, I was asked to be a part of the uh, White House Committee to look at NASA human spaceflight plans. And uh, a lot of things have changed over the years. If you've been following progress, I can kind of bring you up to date to where we are right now. Space Shuttle, of course, was retired in 2011. And personally, I think that was a mistake and it kind of hurt me to, to watch these beautiful machines go into museums, but it is what it is and we have to kind of keep moving on. We're still building the next generation uh, government spacecraft called Orion. Orion is, as you can see, we've gone back to a capsule design 
and uh, it's being it's being designed so that it can one day take humans well beyond low Earth orbit and bring them back safely and still be reusable. We still have our international partners working with us on the new programs. The European Space Agency, for example, is is supplying the uh, the uh, the service module that is underneath Orion that will allow it to maneuver and change orbits once it gets into space. We're also building a new series of rockets called the Space Launch System, or the SLS. Comes in two variants. The variant on the left launches Orion into low Earth orbit. The variant on the right is called the Heavy Lift variant. That'll take the other components of a spacecraft system into uh, orbit to be assembled in orbit and then be propelled away from the Earth. Probably the most exciting yet the most controversial part of the policy back then was that NASA was ordered to help commercial companies develop the capability to launch astronauts on their own. SpaceX, of course, uh, everyone's heard of SpaceX. In fact, we almost had a launch just a couple days ago and hopefully we'll have that launch tomorrow. They've been launching their rocket and their spacecraft uh, loaded with cargo successfully to the International Space Station for a number of years now. Hopefully tomorrow we'll see two astronauts, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, launch for the very first time since 2011 from U.S. soil on a U.S. vehicle first time on a commercial vehicle, and this will be a big shot in the arm for all of us, especially for NASA and for SpaceX. The other company receiving NASA funding and assistance is uh, the Boeing company, of course, very well-known name there in aerospace. They're developing their own spacecraft called Starliner. In the case of Starliner, Starliner will hopefully fly not too much later than, than SpaceX. It'll launch aboard an Atlas V rocket. Atlas is the longest serving rocket in the US stable, very reliable rocket, been constantly upgraded for over the years. As far as ISS goes, ISS is slated for operation through at least 2024, and uh, it's fully expected, hopefully, that it will be extended. It's a very important part of any exploration program because you, we have to design uh, equipment and we have to design medical countermeasures on how to keep astronauts healthy during, say, a mission to Mars, and we have to test and prove those things in space on a platform like the ISS. Of course, you've been hearing recently a lot about moon missions. And the goal the president has set is to get back to the moon by 2024. That's a very ambitious goal, not impossible, but very ambitious. It may or may not involve a gateway. Probably we're going to have a two-pronged program now. The gateway will allow us eventually to sustainably uh, explore the moon and then allow us to go on to Mars. I think it's very important that we go to the moon before we go to Mars for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that we haven't landed on the moon since 1972, and so we need to relearn how to do that. We need to test out our habitats, our rovers, spacesuits, our operations, train astronauts, do all those things uh, and before we send a rocket and, and the spacecraft off to Mars. Of course, the goal is to get boots on the ground on the Red Planet in a sustainable manner, kind of continue to explore Mars, and, and we can only imagine some of the discoveries that we're going to make once we can start getting astronauts out there to supplement all the cool things we've already learned from the rovers that we've been spending over the past few decades. Well, there's something very exciting going on in the industry called the Great Rocket Race, and companies like SpaceX have really tilted and changed the way that we launch satellites. They've dramatically dropped the price of what it costs to launch a satellite. Other companies are coming up with their own rockets that will also drop the cost. Companies like Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' is Blue Origin, and this is good old American competition, bringing the price down for everyone and the quality up. Even the incumbents, United Launch Alliance, had said all these things were impossible. After SpaceX showed that they could do it, and they could keep doing it, and now United Launch Alliance is designing their quote-unquote low-cost rocket called the Vulcan, and it's going to be, uh, in a way, imitating a lot of the way things that uh, SpaceX has done, and so that just shows you the value of this kind of competition. Of course, SpaceX wants to go to Mars. Uh, Elon Musk has said many times that he started SpaceX because he wants to put colonies on Mars and he himself wants to travel to and live on Mars. A couple of years ago, SpaceX did something really cool. They launched the biggest rocket uh, out of the U on US, off of US soil that has flown since the Saturn, uh, Saturn V rockets. What's cool about this launch, one of the cool things, is those two boosters on the side. You see the core has three sections. The two on the outside, those were 
from previous launches of satellites. Those were the first stages from those rockets that came back and landed, were refurbished and reused again. That's one way that SpaceX has dramatically brought, dropped the price of launching, uh, launching things. Here's a really cool picture. This is for real. These are those two same boosters having flown their second mission coming back and landing. They're not taking off, they're landing back on their pads uh, back at the, at the Cape Canaveral, ready to be refurbished and reused again. Usually when you launch a new rocket, you launch water as the payload. That's because if the rocket has a problem and explodes, you just spray a bunch of water everywhere. It's not a big deal. Of course, SpaceX and Elon Musk they couldn't just do that. They launched Elon Musk's red Tesla Roadster, and they launched it into a highly elliptical orbit that can actually came pretty close to Mars. And it's going to stay in orbit around our sun indefinitely for at least millions of years and until, you know, until something runs into it, basically. Uh, but I thought that was a pretty cool thing. SpaceX is not standing still. They're working on their next generation vehicle called Starship and their next generation launcher called the Falcon Super Heavy. And uh, this is the spacecraft Elon Musk says that one day will evolve into a version where uh, they will be able to take up to somewhere around 100 people at a time to Mars. Pretty exciting stuff. SpaceX already has uh, its first flying customer, uh, if you will, lined up for the, the Starship. Uh, a Japanese investor has invested uh, an undisclosed sum. Uh, the rumor has it somewhere probably around the uh, you know $800 million mark to uh, help to jumpstart this uh, this effort. And so, uh, you know, hopefully in the next few years, we'll see a, a flight and this investor, along with 15 of his closest friends, are, have been promised a flight around the moon in the new Starship. Well, this is what Elon Musk thinks that his colony on Mars is gonna look like. You can see it looks very uh, sci-fi with uh, from the 1950s with rockets landing back on their tail fins but this is how he really envisions that starship is going to work it's you know mars's gravity is only a little more than one-third that of the earth and so his plan is to propulsively land these spacecraft on their tail fins and then uh, because the gravity is so much lower they can refuel and then launch from uh, off of their tail fins as well to return back to earth well, finally, this is uh, the last photograph I want to leave you with. This, of course, is a photo of the moon, and it was the moon that inspired me all those years ago to want to be an astronaut. On the left side, Mother Earth, home planet to all of us, and that blue in the middle is what surprised me the most the first time I looked out back at the Earth. The sunlight going through our atmosphere caused it to glow, almost fluoresce, these beautiful shades of blue. So this photo says dreams to me, and especially for young people, but for everyone, and especially in these difficult times, it's important to keep dreaming, dreaming and keep motivated and keep moving ahead. And before I close, I do want to show you one more video. Uh, Daniel mentioned my company, One Orbit. We've been proud partners with, with Space Center Houston for many years. We work on different programs together, including Astronaut Friday. And so let's go ahead and play that video, please. collaboration, curiosity, and creativity. All right, well, thank you all for joining today. Uh, here's, uh, and I want to thank Space Center Houston for putting this on, and Daniel and his team, everyone over there did a fantastic job. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I think we've got some questions, and I believe Kimberly is going to be uh, asking, asking your questions for you.
Yeah, space shuttle launches were pretty violent because they had solid rocket boosters on the side, those big white solid rocket boosters. And what happens is that T-Zero, when you light those solid rocket boosters, you're adding almost 5 million pounds of thrust to the 1.5 million pounds of thrust that the main engines are already generating. And so you're literally exploded off the pad. There's a huge boom when those, those engines light and it feels like someone just kicked the back of your chair. There's a lot of vibration because solid fuel by its nature burns unevenly. So there's a lot of shaking going on. You can hear the wind noise, the pitch of the wind noise changing very rapidly, which tells you you're accelerating very quickly. Space shuttle, it, it looks like kind of lumbers off the pad, but by the time it's cleared the tower, it's already going over 100 miles an hour, and about a little over a minute later, it's already flying faster than the speed of sound. So that kind of gives you an idea how dramatic it is. And like I said before, it takes right around nine minutes to get from the launch pad up into low Earth orbit. We got another great question about what does it actually feel like in space while you're floating? Floating is pretty weird, especially the first time. Uh, once you get up into space, you immediately notice some changes. You get very dizzy. Your inner ear, your balance system is making, giving nonsense signals to your brain and tells you you're tumbling and your eyes tell you you're not, and that causes you to get very dizzy. Uh, you feel a big fluid shift. There's no longer gravity pulling all the fluid down into your legs. It all comes up into your your torso and, and kind of you, you feel full headed. You feel a little bit like you're standing on your head, you know, and, and then everything and then it's really weird because you're floating and everything around you is floating. Uh, but, you know, humans are remarkably adaptable. And after a few days, it kind of starts seeming normal uh, to be floating around. Then when you come back to Earth, even after a short shuttle mission of a week or two, you're already adapted to space uh, to a large degree and you've got to readapt to gravity. Again, you're very dizzy again because now your brain doesn't know what to do with these signals that it's supposed to get. And uh, you know, it takes you a few days to, to get used to that. And then you feel kind of a little weak. You know, you feel you're, you haven't been using your muscles as much and you're not used to having to fight gravity or even walk around. So very interesting, a lot of changes biomedically going up and coming back. Excellent. A um, bunch of folks want to know, out of all of your missions, what was your favorite mission and why? Now, it's hard to choose. I mean, how, I don't know how you top the first mission. You know, the first time I got to go up into space and, you know, the excitement of, of getting into the rocket and getting up there and looking back at the Earth and doing all those things. But I got to say the most rewarding was is probably my last one. It's certainly my last one, the International Space Station mission, uh, you know, just kind of brought together all my previous space mission experiences and leadership lessons learned and, and allowed me to be the commander of the station and to, to go do that long duration flight and fly up and down on a Russian spacecraft. So I would say it's hard to pick a favorite, but I would say the most exciting one was the first one and, and probably the most rewarding was the, the last one. Great. Um Four-year-old August wants to know, what was your favorite experiment that you worked on on the space station? My favorite experiment aboard the space station was one that we called uh, a demonstration of telemedicine using an ultrasound machine. And so using an ultrasound machine to image each other's internal organs and bones and teeth, and we even did the first eye exam in space using an ultrasound machine, uh, we were able to demonstrate that with doctor's help on the ground, we could be their hands, if you will, in space and, and do these diagnostics. That's going to be important as we fly farther and deeper into space, uh, one day hopefully to Mars, because, you know, we will have a doctor on board, no doubt, but that doctor may need assistance in diagnosing a problem that someone else is having, and this technique demonstrated how that worked. And what was really neat about this is the scientist, the doctor who came up with all this stuff, he actually applied this on the ground and he sent teams of medical students into these developing countries and used the same techniques, sometimes using satellite phones, sometimes using the local uh, cellular phone network to do wellness exams, for example, for, for expecting mothers in these uh, little villages. And so he was able to take a technique developed for space flight and make life better for people on the ground too. Great. These questions are rolling in now. Evelyn wants to know, what did you learn on your missions that you did not expect to find out? Well, you always learn things uh, in space that you don't find, expect to find out. That's the whole point of, of research work, right? And one of the surprising things of a lot of experiments that we do in space, uh, we do them in space because there's no gravity. And so, for example, 
I, we, we, thought, we felt that we could grow more perfect protein crystals to help pharmaceutical companies develop these, these pharmaceuticals against these different kinds of diseases. And so the protein crystal is like a model of the disease and allows them to design molecules to attack that model. And so we were able to build better protein grow better protein crystals in space. Of course, that's an expensive endeavor to bring these materials up to space and then you know, grow them and then bring them back safely. Uh, but the interesting thing is, and this is just one example, we learned how to do it better in space, but by, by learning how to do it better in space, they were able to figure out how to do it better on the ground as well. And so they saved the expense of having to always go to space to do it. And so we're not really, you know, that was one surprise is that, you know, we figured out how to, how to do things better in space, but then the surprise is that we could take that knowledge and then figure out how to do it better here on the ground as well. And that's just one example. There are many like that. Great. We've got a, a bunch of questions too about Mars here. So why are we focused on going to Mars as opposed to other planets? And do you think that the timeline of going 2032 um, might actually work? Mars is our next closest neighbor. And so it's the next logical planet for us to go to. And there are also many other scientific reasons and interesting reasons to go to Mars. You might have seen in the news just months ago, only months ago, NASA announced that the Curiosity rover found embedded methane in sedimentary rock. And what that means is that methane was buried in that rock billions of years ago, maybe two or more billion years ago. And what's exciting about that is one way the methane might have gotten there, there could have been something alive, like some kind of microbial life, that is life that you know you need a microscope to see. But that the fact that there might have been life billions of years ago on Mars that created that methane that got trapped in the rock is really, really exciting. So if we can send astronauts to Mars one day to actually do some digging and who knows, maybe they'll find some no kidding evidence, hard evidence, you know, of fossilized remains of, of microbial life or even, you know, maybe even a little more complex life. Just think of the cultural impact of finding life in our own cosmic backyard, the next planet over from us. I mean, that would be really huge. As far as getting there by 2032, that's ambitious. No kidding, it's ambitious. But Elon Musk is dedicated to doing it. I don't know if he'll get there by 2032. And I don't know if, if he'll do it by himself or SpaceX or in collaboration with NASA. But I, I, would, I will say this, I'm, I'm almost positive he will get to Mars. Uh, question of when, by 2032, he'll tell you that he'll get there well before 2032. But of course, uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how all that works out. Uh, Kate wants to know if there were any animals on any of your space flights. Yes, there were on my first space flight. It was a research flight, and we had a, a, the Japanese a payload package included a lot of aquatic animals. So we had a little a Japanese goldfish. We had little madaka fish, which are like minnows. We had Japanese red-bellied newts. You know, these little uh, kind of these uh, salamander-like uh, like creatures. And we studied these creatures and these animals because they have inner ear balance systems just like humans, and we wanted to see how they would adapt to the space environment. And so it was interesting. Yeah, we had little uh, jellyfish, tiny little jellyfish, because they also have gravity sensing organs to know which way is up or down. So we, we did have some animals, some small animals on, our, on some of our flights. Sage wants to know, do rockets go faster than spaceships? <laughs> well, rockets take spacecraft into space. So uh, so they're going about the same speed once you get up into space, right? So you need the rocket to get the spacecraft or the spaceship, if you will, uh, up to space and up to those uh, the orbital velocity of about 17,500 miles an hour. Great. Um, let's see. Hannah uh, wants to know, what were you thinking about just right before um, sitting in the rocket during the launch? So, you know, you get into the vehicle, you get into the rocket about two and a half hours before launch, right? And so during that time, there's a lot of things going on, mostly with the launch control center and the engineers checking things and, you know, you're, you're fueling, you're doing all those things. And so, um, or replenishing fuel, I should say. And so you've got a lot of downtime and actually most of the time, you know, we might take a little nap, <laughs> might actually doze off for a little while and then, 
you know, we wake up, of course, in plenty of time and, and it starts getting more real as you get inside the final 30 minutes or so. And uh, for, for my first launch, you know, you get into the vehicle, everything's very familiar because we've spent hundreds of hours in the simulator. So all the switches, the control panels, everything's very familiar. And uh, so you feel like you're at home. But then it became very real in the last minute. At T minus one minute, that's when we got the call from the launch control center to close and lock our visors, initiate oxygen flow, and have a good flight. So that last minute goes by very quickly, and that's when you get the shot of adrenaline and and you start getting you know start getting fired up and and uh, ready to go. And then when you actually launch, that's that's actually what I felt was relief because uh, what happens is you know as an astronaut, you're always you know, as you get closer to your launch, it might sound funny, but the thing we, we're afraid of is not the risk. The thing we're afraid of is something's going to happen that gets us, keeps us from getting to go. You know, just imagine if, if maybe days or weeks before you get a medical disqualification, or maybe in the days or weeks leading up to the launch, you get in a bad car accident, you know. And so, but once those boosters light uh, on the shuttle, uh, you're going somewhere. And once they lit, I actually felt a big wave of relief and then excitement. Great. Um, Brian wants to know if your heart rate goes up when you're in space. Well, once you're up in space, I think, uh, and, and your body kind of adapts to the environment, I think everything kind of goes back to normal. You know, uh, of course, I'm sure your heart rate's elevated during launch. You know, it's, it's up there a little bit. And when you're doing space walks, you're working very hard physically. And so it's like a, a big workout for like six hours, six and a half hours each time. And so your heart rate's certainly elevated while you're working hard in space suit. Space walking is very physical. It's not like the movies at all. It's not just this easy move around thing. All right, and the last question, any advice to the kiddos that are watching now who want to become an astronaut? Absolutely, my advice to young people, no matter if you wanna become an astronaut or anything else, it's pretty much the same. It's, you know, first of all, you, you find your passion. You know, what is your passion? If it's to be an astronaut, that's great. That certainly was my passion. And so, but if it's for something else, if it's another part of technology or if it's, if it's science or if it's uh, uh, in the arts, you know, if it's literature or if it's, you know, performance art or, or something like that, figure out what you want to do then, and then figure out a plan, a way to get there. What should I study in school to help me get to that goal? And then once you've got all that, you know, and it's okay if you change your mind, that's okay. That's human nature. We all change our minds. But then the thing is work hard, you know, do the very best you can in school. And if equally important, do the very best you can to take care of your health. Because if your body is healthy, if you're physically healthy, then your mind is going to be the healthiest it can be and it can it's going to operate at the highest efficiency and that'll get you as you know the farthest you can get and, and towards a good and rewarding life great that was the last question all right today. well thank you everyone i hope everyone enjoyed it i've sure had a great time and uh, exciting to be um meeting with you all today and hopefully as Daniel said, sometime, uh, hopefully July 1st on, we'll, we'll all get to meet each other in person again down at Space Center Houston. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Chow, for that amazing talk. You know, it's fantastic to hear everything, you know, to, to explore your knowledge and everything you, you bring to us. We appreciate that. Uh, definitely want to encourage people, if you, if you look for opportunities to to have Dr. Chow come to your school or go to your business, you know, check out oneorbitcdr.com uh, for some great opportunities there. Uh, and like he said, we're super excited to reopen on July 1st with time ticketing. So watch closely for us to uh, watch closely on our website to explore those opportunities. And again, please check out our virtual resources at spacecenter.org backslash resources. And one additional exciting event that we're happy to announce is uh, we have these virtual camp-ins that happen, uh, that's gonna happen next Friday. And we're excited to announce that uh, the astronaut artist, Nicole Stott will be joining us for that experience. So check us out on the website for that, for that opportunity, sign up. It's a great chance to, to spend time with your family, put a tent up in the backyard, do some great hands-on STEM activities and, and hear from, you know, another fantastic astronaut like Leroy Chow. 
So I want to thank everybody for, for your attendance. I want to thank you for taking this time to be with us and to be part of the NASA mission. Make sure you watch that launch tomorrow and keep dreaming and exploring space. Thank you very much.